Um, so there were so many colleagues, so many people who uh, stood in solidarity with Tom and, and helped build this community. And um, Tom, you just you represent to me um, one of the the more steadfast, um, and you've worked closely with him for many years. And just thank you for being here. Well, it's, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I just want to share some uh, how Tom influenced me. You've heard some great stories about him. Uh, I came to humanism rather late in life, you know, my 30s, uh, and I grew up as a Catholic. I went, actually was confirmed right here in St. Paul Church. I grew up in Cambridge. Uh, but as I began, I was, I was also a psychologist, and as I grew, began to read uh, Abraham Maslow and Kyle Rogers and read some humanist literature, I, you know, I began to see the light, and, uh, and I joined the American Humanist Association, started to get their magazine, and learned that we had a humanist chaplain right here in my, my hometown. So I stopped in to see him, and I was still kind of uh, struggling with my humanism, uh, and he was such a genuine guy, and I, I would call him uh, my humanist hub. Uh, before this building was was occupied, uh, because he, uh, well, I would go to him, we, and as somebody else mentioned, we would have uh, 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 lunch in the square and sit out and talk, and he got me involved in the American in the, in the uh, uh, Humanist Association of Massachusetts, and he introduced me to to Joe uh, 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 Epstein, uh, <laughs> and, and when I got involved in the in the Smart Recovery uh, Program. And, uh, and, and, and he also got me involved in the Humanist Institute. I, I actually went to New York City for three years and studied humanism. And so I have evolved, as Greg, uh, as Greg indicated, uh, I have evolved through my contact with, with Tom. Tom has helped me uh, uh, develop as a human being. And, uh, and, and I've been, all of my activities since I became a humanist I've, I've evolved and grown through my contact with Tom. He eventually got me on the, on the uh, uh, Harvard uh, Humanist uh, uh, Association, uh, the, uh, 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 the uh, Harvard uh, uh, Humanist uh, uh, Board that, uh, uh, that exists now. And so he's influenced me in a tremendous, tremendously positive way through his, uh, through his friendship. And so I'm very happy to just share my memories of Tom. They're a tremendous influence on my life. You know, Joe, you were uh, born the same year as my father, and you actually look like him, too. So, uh, Tom uh, mentioned us as having the same last name. Boy. Um, before we get to that, um, a couple of things. One. This is something, we didn't have a chance to talk about this in advance for various reasons, but I just, so forgive me because this is uh, an ad lib, but I just wanted to ask you, did you, would you like to share anything with us? Um, we'd be delighted to have you come and say a couple of words if you'd like, and if not, no pressure really. It's, it, I just wanted to make sure that, since I didn't get a chance to ask you earlier, I thought you, maybe you wouldn't mind. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. My brother Tom has been in my life as a very, very good man. And when he saw things that weren't right, he was angry. <laughs> to say the least. And um, he would, uh, he would talk to me about being in a seminary, and I had questions. And I found out that the questions he had in the seminary were not answered by the instructor. They didn't have answers for his questions. That's OK. <laughs> so um, I am delighted. And I am pleased that you people have taken Tom in because it was very hard for him to leave what he had learned and believed in for so many years. 
But I knew he was angry about a lot of things about the Catholic religion. And they bugged him. Bugged him, bugged him. So when he had an opportunity to change that and lead others into it, made him very happy. I am so grateful that you have supported him in the past. I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Oh, and I thank you for being humanist and everything that you did for Tom, too. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's unprepared, but a real gift to us. Um, Deb Dawson. So Tom uh, spent half a lifetime helping to expand chaplaincy at Harvard, not just to humanists, but to many, many others. Uh, he was very proud of his work alongside people with whom he disagreed vigorously <laughs> on all manner of theological issues, and, and they loved him. Um, and Deb, you have worked for many years, uh, being the lifeline to us as Harvard chaplains. You, uh, you make the Harvard Chaplains organization work, um, and we love you. And Tom had this office right next to you, which you know I've, I've had for the last several years, but I, um, I just think the two of you guys have had a special connection, and I'm so glad that you could be with us to talk about him and to share uh, words from one other chaplain as well. Thank you, Thank you very much. Excuse me. Uh, these words are written by Cyrus Mehta, so I'm going to read someone else's remembrance. Cyrus uh, was the founder of the Zoroastrian chaplaincy, and he's an entrepreneur in Kendall Square, too, so he's uh, an interesting fellow, but he says some things that I think a lot of the members of the uh, group of chaplains would feel. He says, I love Tom, as did Swami Saravakatandananda, excuse me, I botched that, the Hindu chaplain. Uh, he was honest and compassionate, and he had no use for any form of pretense or holier-than-thou airs. Tom held that all phenomena can be explained by science, and our goal in life is to be kind, helpful, and truthful. He had no use for mysticism or any type of experience that went beyond the body and mind. He was the president of the Harvard Chaplains, then called the United Ministry, when I had first met him. The Swami was invited to come to the meeting because they wanted uh, him to become a member. I used to be the Swami chauffeur and came along to the meeting in that capacity. In short order, Tom proposed that the Swami become a member and that I become an associate member of the United Ministry, and the proposal was approved then and there. Thus, I had the pleasure of interacting with Tom for the next 15 plus years. The highlight of that interaction was a dialogue <coughs> that I arranged whether, between Tom and the Swami. An essential point of difference in their dialogue was whether religion can be considered a science. Swami said that religion was the science of being, the science of consciousness. Tom, on the other hand, stood for secular science only. He said, the concept of spirit is all poetry. It is culture bound. It is an esoteric realm of psychology. They never reconciled their differences on this point, but nevertheless, they were always the closest of companions and on the same side in any discussion or debate in our United Ministry meetings. Tom somehow felt that his worldview was closer to Vedanta than it was to the Western religions. Let me end by sharing something nice that I never imagined about Tom. We were once asked at one of our meetings to say something about ourselves that others did not know. When it was Tom's turn, he said, I really enjoyed dancing. <laughs> I'm so sorry that I never danced with Tom. <laughs> Among other chaplains that uh, sent their regards and really uh, were proud to have served with Tom, 
uh, Pat McLeod, who is the director of uh, CRU, or Harvard's Campus Crusade for Christ, which is one of the most conservative evangelical campus organizations and a very big organization as well. Pat uh, passed on to me that um, Tom was the first Harvard chaplain to really make him feel welcome on campus, and that he mentored him. Pat, uh, a few years after taking over, chaired the membership committee of the Harvard chaplains, and that uh, Tom and he were very close, and, and, and he really, truly really misses him, um, and just spoke beautifully about it to me, and I wanted to pass that on to you, too, uh, as one of many examples. Um, so, a couple more, and then we'll have a last song, and, and we'll have a bite to eat. Um, so, one of the things that Tom did was he created a place, or he helped in a very big way to create a place for a, a humanist who had a love of community. And the ability to play some of the same aspects of, of a professional role that clergy people play, uh, he, he helped to really usher this in as what is now becoming uh, an important a piece of what it is to be a humanist, an important part of the overall humanist community nationwide and worldwide. Um, and so I just want to bring out, we're going to bring uh, Chris, who's our assistant humanist chaplain, um, to give a, a next reflection. Um, but, I, but while you're coming out, Chris, can we just have the members of the staff of HCH who are here and who've been out there, because they've just been helping in so many different ways to put this together. None of what you're seeing here today and hearing here today would be possible without uh, all these young people who, are, who work for Tom's organization, whose, whose job it is to serve the community that Tom built. So I, I just, I just want to recognize everybody here that, that wants to come out. Um, some folks over there as well. Um, yeah, it just, just. Really, really well deserved. Um, Tom paved the way for you, and, and you, each of you, really are paving the way for many others that will follow you, and you, you do him great pride. Um, in fact, Anna and Lindsay back there um, have been spending the last several months with us uh, as interns in existential counseling from uh, the Humanist University of the Netherlands, and went to visit Tom on a weekly basis at Neville Place um, for, for several weeks. Uh, at the end of his life and, and spent some very meaningful time with him and, and with me uh, there and, and with other uh, residents at Neville Place too and I just want to give you special recognition for that and our hope is to maintain a relationship with Neville Place going forward as a community. So if you're interested in that, we can speak about that later. Um, and then uh, Chris, uh, Tom uh, had assistant chaplains before you, I was one of them. Uh, you, you served after him uh, but just in, in such an important way, and the fact that you're now uh, going to be working as the executive director of the uh, Yale, uh, well, the, the chaplaincy at Yale, although we will call it uh, other things, but it's, it's really wonderful that you can be here today just to, to speak. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's such a privilege to be able to participate in this. Um, I, of all the people who have been up here so far today, probably knew Tom least of all. Um, but I wanted to share a short story about the first time that I met Tom. So early on in my first conversation with Tom, uh, when I joined this organization in 2010, he asked me a funny question that really caught me off guard. He asked me, so, you're going to be working here. Do you own a suit? <laughs> and then he gestured toward my very sloppy attire, which has only improved a little bit since then. Like all of you, he laughed, but his laugh was disarming, it was underscored by a striking kindness, and I immediately felt much more comfortable. Like David, I mistakenly felt very intimidated about meeting Tom. I was just starting here at the Humanist Chaplaincy at Harvard. And I knew I wanted to help support this amazing community of atheists, agnostics, and humanists, and that I was deeply inspired by Tom's vision, and as a gay atheist, deeply indebted to the work that he had done. But it would be an understatement to say that I was not sure what I was doing. And I was certain that Tom, who had been doing this work for many years, would agree. 
but his friendly teasing was actually a disguised invitation to reflect, something he was quite good at, on why I wanted to work with this community. As it turned out, that had in fact been his goal from the start. His gentle teasing had been intended to crack me open. It was a nudge to more deeply consider my hopes and my fears going into this work. When we were finished with our conversation that day, he said, quite simply, thank you for being here. It was a sentence he surely said to thousands and thousands of people during his tenure as our community's first chaplain, but it felt entirely genuine, as I'm sure it did to everyone that he helped. Though he was incredibly thoughtful and intelligent, it was his kindness, his invitational and welcoming demeanor that struck me most that day. There are many things that one could say about Tom, but the most important of those things, based on my experiences with him, is that he was kind, generous, welcoming, and wise, and that he inspired many people, both humanists and non-humanists alike, with a life dedicated to helping others along the way. There was a lovely profile of Tom published in 2005 that concluded with a characteristically stirring quote from Tom. It was, Bertrand Russell said, in the end, kindness is the foremost virtue. It's a survival technique, this kindness. Our civili civilization depends on it. But Tom practiced this kindness far beyond survival. His work embodied the reality that kindness doesn't just help us to survive. It makes our own lives and the lives of those around us that much richer. How do you pay tribute to someone who did so much for so many people over so many years? No single reflection could do his life justice. But all of us on the staff at HCH, who have been so inspired by all that he did and so influenced by him, will carry him forward in our lives, hoping to mirror even a fraction of his wisdom and his compassion and his love for other people. A month before Tom died, his good friend Joe Gerstein asked me if I wanted some of Tom's old suits. <laughs> I suspect that Tom would grin if he saw me trying them on recently. I'm not wearing one of them now, so I have to get them fixed a little bit. But I imagine if he saw me, he would tease me, saying, there, now you're finally dressing for the job. <laughs> But those suits, as great as they are, pale in comparison to Tom's greatest gift, which was a trailblazing and generous life of service, defined by courage, innovation, and an example of the importance of kindness. Thank you. We'll have you back for a brief tradition of ours uh, after this last one. <laughs> Joe Gerstein. This is just speculation on my part. Um, I don't really know uh, whether it's accurate or not, but I, I guess I would say that after 30 plus years of working with him with such passion and dedication and your enormous support of him and now enabling uh, him to realize so much of his vision and then taking care of him when he needed it most, I guess I would just like to say publicly that it strikes me that you very well might have been his greatest friend. And if you could give the last reflection for tonight, for today, I'd really appreciate that. Now I know what the expression, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. <laughs> First, I do want to read a, uh, a note that was sent by Nicholas uh, Johnson, uh, Nick Johnson, a good friend of Tom's as well. He's in Ireland and couldn't come to this. Uh, but he is responsible as much as anyone for the success of the Humanist Chaplaincy at Harvard. He uh, instigated the creation of the corporation of the Harvard Humanist Chaplaincy in 1991 and did not only all the work in getting it done, but uh, corralling everyone and forcing everyone to get involved, twisting everybody's arm to make sure that it got done. And, and that was crucial in, a, in enabling 
uh, the financing of the organization to the degree that Tom could have a fairly comfortable last years. Nothing luxurious, <laughs> mind you, for sure, but at least comfortable. So Nick writes this. He says, most of us have fond memories of Tom Ferrick. I am one of those. I've known Tom for some 30 years, starting long before the time I served on the humanist chaplaincy at Harvard's board. Tom was often a guest at chapter meetings of American Atheist Society, as well as other local humanist groups, of which I was a member. He always spoke with clarity, knowledge, compassion, and always with a friendly attitude. He brought dignity and respect to the cause of humanism. <coughs> Tom and I also had many conversations on various issues. At one time, he told me of a letter Cardinal Law had written inviting him to discuss his return to the priesthood. <laughs> I don't remember the exact words Tom used in his reply, but he said something to the effect that the moral and intellectual gulf between the two of them was too wide to be bridged. <laughs> what a wonderful way to say no. <laughs> Incidentally, Tom finally received his uh, letter of excommunication about 30 years late, but he did, he did get it. I found it in, uh, in uh, going through his papers. Uh, Tom went on to tell me that he had decided to leave the priesthood after realizing that what he was preaching to the congregation was something he did not believe in and could not in good conscience continue to teach. He then made his decision to leave and informed the Cardinal, at that time it was Cardinal Cushing, in an attempt, the Cardinal in his attempt to persuade Tom to stay stated, Tom, they will not love you out there as much as they love you here. That statement made me think for a moment. The Cardinal was wrong. He is loved more sincerely here than there. Tom was not only a friend of mine, but a good colleague during the time we worked to establish the Humanist Chaplaincy at Harvard. His dedication to, to and promotion of the ideals of humanism served as an inspiration to me in establishing a chaplaincy as part of the Humanist Association of Ireland. Nick Johnson, Director of Chaplaincy Services, Humanist Association of Ireland, Dublin, Ireland. So, we see that Tom has had an international influence. <laughs> Thomas Michael Ferrick, 1929-2013. Tom and I were friends and colleagues for 30 years. We were partners in building humanist organizations in Massachusetts and in promoting humanism. Humanism as a socially and politically acceptable and indeed laudable source of ethical behavior and as a rational way of comprehending the vagaries of the universe. Tom was born on July 5th, 1929. I must say I am much too much aware of every date in Tom's life, every certificate and so forth and so on, having had to uh, make out all his forms and tax reports for the last couple of years. July 5th, 1929. Since he died last year, his life bookended the two greatest economic panics of the 20th century. Black Friday occurred within a few months of his birth. A more calamitous event for him personally was the death of both of his parents from tuberculosis. In that era, every city had its own sanatorium. Now all of these buildings have been renovated as condos or community centers. A medical student in Massachusetts might well pass his or her entire career without ever seeing a case of TB. So the world has changed. The life of him and his siblings could have been Dickensian, but they were taken in by a loving aunt and uncle, and so brought up in a caring and supportive environment. Tom venerated these people, and until his death, a large framed photo of his uncle hung above his bed. Tom and his brother were both motivated to join the Catholic priesthood. Tom graduated the College of the Holy Cross, went to a Jesuit seminary, and was ordained. His brother joined the Dominicans. His brother became a parish priest in a Peruvian town where he developed a gallbladder infection and died as he was being carried to Lima. 
Tom's career in the church was always tinged with a degree of skepticism about its doctrines and its bureaucracy, which his brother did not share. So they argued incessantly about these issues. Tom was appointed Catholic, ch Catholic chaplain at Dartmouth College in the 60s. Obviously, he had the intellectual heft and the personal charm to qualify for that role. He was a lightning rod for resistance to the Vietnam War there. Perhaps because of that, he was transferred to a parish in Dorchester where he continued to lead demonstrations against the war. It is difficult for me to visualize Tom with his decorous, reserved demeanor chanting and ranting on anti-war marches. <laughs> Obviously, he had his reservations about St. Augustine's just war precepts to add to his quiver of doubts. During this period, his doubts and concerns about Catholic doctrine and about the backstabbing and Machiavellian activities among the hierarchy crystallized in a decision to leave the church. After an interview with Cardinal Cushing failed to induce him to stay, he departed. This was an act of conscience that left him destitute. But like his heretical forebears, Giordano Bruno, Galileo Galilei, Jan Hus, and John Wycliffe, and countless others lost in the fog of history, he placed conscience above conformity and orthodoxy. Tom had obtained a master's degree in counseling, but instead of heading for that line of work, he accepted a position as leader of the Boston Ethical Society for an extremely modest salary. Tom never made more than a pittance, but never complained and circumscribed his impecunious lifestyle to his income. After a while, the Boston Ethical Society was unable to cover his salary. Somehow, Colas Lamont, who was a professor at Columbia at the time and the scion of a famous uh, family, uh, a generous family to Harvard, uh, uh, heard of his predicament and donated a small annual stipend to the Humanist Association of Massachusetts, of which Tom was by then the unpaid executive director and arranged for him to be appointed to the Harvard Board of Chaplaincy. Thus, Tom was not only the first humanist chaplain at an American university, but had the distinction of having been a chaplain at two Ivy League schools under two different belief systems. <laughs> <laughs> the rest, folks, is history. John Loeb read about Tom's activities at Harvard in the Gazette and invited him to New York. They became friends. The penniless Harvard Humanist Chaplain and the New York plutocrat who believed in deed, not creed, which certainly resonates with humanists. I don't think it's likely we will ever hear a repeat of Harvard President Rudenstein's admission at the memorial service for John Lowe that he had responded with amazement, the humanist, what? at John Loeb's <laughs> announcement that he was going to designate 1% of his huge bequest to Harvard to endow the humanist chaplains. Tom told me of his childhood fascination with Flash Gordon as featured in the movie series, probably the first sign of his gay orientation. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's old enough to remember the flash <laughs> uh, Probably, uh, he did live to enjoy the exhilaration of the Massachusetts Supreme Court decision enabling gay marriage. And although he was far gone into dementia, he had tears in his eyes when I told him of the U.S. Supreme Court's affirmation of the California Supreme Court's rejection of the results of the anti-gay marriage referendum. Tom was an active on, of activist on end-of-life autonomy and a member of the Death with Dignity Board of Directors. His life ended with a grim trek down the dark path of dementia, which he endured with the support of his friends, but with extreme distaste and reluctant tolerance as he saw his rigorous intellect crumbling. Fortunately, he had competent and humane physicians during his last days. His end was sudden and painless. Thank you. I just want to read.
reassure those who are keeping account that um, that modest endowment from the Loeb estate, we didn't spend it on this place. Uh, <laughs> it still exists. It's about $800,000 to this day under the terms that it was given, and, and we still get about twenty-five to $30,000 per year uh, from it uh, through Harvard. This is a little bit more per year than Tom originally asked for, actually. Um, but I just wanted to say that because you, know, you might be worried and also because uh, really this place uh, wouldn't be what it is without so many of you who, just worth saying once again, uh, you've built this place and, and you uh, who have supported us and, and, and given of your time and your, your volunteerism and your, and your money uh, have made it possible for Tom to have such an incredible legacy. Um, just thought I'd throw that in there. Um, but I want to take a moment to just reflect silently in any way that we might choose. Part of remembering Tom. So we have a couple of uh, traditions that we have created to conclude these meetings. The last will be just a, a piece of music. Uh, but before we do that, something that we call the moment of connection. And I'll let Chris explain that. Hello again. <clears throat> The reflections that we heard today represent just a sliver of the impact that Tom had on so many people. So we'd like to take this moment to invite all of you who are here to take a few minutes to turn to someone near you and to share either a personal memory of Tom or a story that you heard today that made you reflect on the importance of supportive resources in this kind of community and the kind of work that Tom devoted his life to. So if you could take just a few minutes turn to someone near you and share something about Tom's life, that would be wonderful. Plenty of time uh, after the event for more of this kind of sharing, and I hope that you will stick around. Um, we'll have refreshments, and um, would love to hear many more stories. And there will be a screening again um, of Tom telling his life story uh, later on. But um, I hope that you uh, enjoyed today's event, and I hope you'll join me just for a moment in looking around the room, because in the many different faces that we see here you will see part of Tom's legacy. It's evident in the many, many people he helped, in the lives he touched, in the stories that you all shared with one another. It's evident in this community that he established as a safe space for non-religious people and humanists, among the first of its kind in this country. And so in that respect, it's my honor to announce that we are creating a new endowed position specifically intended to further Tom's legacy that we are calling the Tom Farrick Memorial Assistant Humanist Chaplain at Harvard. Tom believed that non-religious students and community members deserve to have access to the same kinds of resources as religious students and community members. And he dedicated his life to this conviction, ensuring that humanist students at Harvard and in the local community had a seat at the table and access to support when they needed it. And there are very few of these humanist chaplaincies in the world and here at the humanist community at Harvard, we want to ensure that Tom's trailblazing legacy lives on. Now more than ever, with this new space and a growing presence in the community, 
there are more students and more community members in need of support. <coughs> and while our organization does have a small endowment, we are growing so quickly. And in wanting to expand and deepen Tom's vision and his legacy as the founder of one of the few campus-based humanist chaplaincies in the world, and this is a legacy that expands each year with the creation of new programs on other campuses directly inspired by the one he founded here, we have decided to create this endowed position that will guarantee that non-religious students and community members in and around Harvard will always have access to a supportive resource. Now, as one of two chaplains working here, I'm actually leaving this organization in a few months and this position will replace mine. And as the community will have one last chaplain uh, come May, and as Greg has to balance his work as a chaplain with his growing responsibilities as the executive director of an organization that now has a staff of 10 people, and taking into consideration that other Harvard-based chaplaincies that serve the number of students that we do have several chaplains rather than just one or two, we see this as a vital position. In fact, despite our rapid growth, this organization has not had a chaplain solely dedicated to counseling and supporting community members in some time because Greg has been both a chaplain and the director of this organization, and I've been a chaplain while also coordinating our Values in Action program and assisting with other programs. So this position would be unique in that it would be dedicated solely to furthering Tom's life's work of counseling and supporting humanist students and community members. Many of you may know our friend Nathan Dye from the Humanist Association of Massachusetts and Greater Boston Humanists. He moved. There he is. <laughs> Nathan is with us today. Nathan was greatly influenced by Tom, who was there when Nathan needed support. And he's here with us today and has generously volunteered to make himself available to anyone who would like to learn more about how they can help endow Tom's legacy through this uh, memorial position. The agnostic astronomer Carl Sagan once said, to live in the hearts of those left behind is to never die. In this sense, Tom will live on forever through this community and the incredible work that he did to help people along the way. I know that I speak for so many people when I say that I'm so deeply grateful for that and grateful to have had the opportunity to learn from him and to have his support and to be a part of a community that meant so much to him and means so much to all of us because of him. So thank you so much for your time and thank you for being here with us today. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, they're going to be very, very fortunate to have you at Yale. And Nathan, thank you so much, you and Jackie, uh, for driving up from Maryland to be here with us. And you're going to give wonderful, wonderful advice to anybody who's even considering uh, taking Chris up on that uh, plan. So please speak to Nathan afterwards if you'd like. Uh, when I met Tom, early 2001. I was a couple of years out of college uh, where I had been a bit of a singer in a ragtag rock band and the first event that Tom invited me to speak at in 2002, uh, I sang at the end of it and I think he was a little bewildered. <laughs> <laughs> and I rarely sing publicly anymore. <laughs> But there happens to be a song from the musical Wicked, which follows on the legacy of the very, very humanistic Wizard of Oz. It's called For Good. And it is the most beautiful song I've ever heard about a mentor and the effect that he or she can have on a student. So I wanted to sing it for you. I also want to thank uh, Tom Anderson and Mike Ball, representatives of our Humanist Hub uh, House Band. Something that we've put a lot of thought into creating. We're really delighted that you guys can be here. I've heard it said that people come 
come into our lives for a reason bringing something we must learn and we are led to those who help us most to grow if we let them and we help them in return well I don't know if I But I know I'm who I am today Because I knew you Like a comet pulled from orbit As it passes the sun Like a stream that meets a boulder Halfway through the wood Who can say if I've been changed for the better That we will never meet again in this lifetime So let me say before I part So much of me is made of what I learned from you And you'll be with me Like a handprint on my heart stories end I know you'll have rewritten mine by being my friend like a ship blown from its mooring by a wind off the sea like a sea dropped by a sky bird in a distant wood who can say if I've been Because I knew you I have been changed for good something to eat, hang around, talk, and we'll do the showing after when it's time. We'll figure it out. Thank you so much, everybody.